Welcome back, everyone. Let's just uh, mention one uh, question that's come in here and try to respond to that. One person uh, said uh, we've been talking about the emotional aspects of attachments, and uh, uh, he or she was wondering uh, if I could reflect a little bit on the social forces that complicate people's attachments. And I think uh, I, I think it's an excellent question. And uh, we are, of course, living in a social context where we are. Um, uh, these uh, false beliefs are fed to us uh, day by day and moment by moment. Just consider the uh, the impact of advertising in our lives, where uh, so. Uh, so much uh, effort is given to advertising uh, by, um, by uh, the people who produce and offer uh, goods to us. We are constantly being bombarded with messages that we need this thing to be happy or we need this thing to be successful. Um, uh, we, we see a picture of a very successful looking person driving a fancy car and the, the underlying message, even if it's not explicitly said, is, uh, is you too could uh, be like this person uh, by having this car. <laughs> and so these messages are given to us constantly. Uh, I think of uh, passing a magazine rack in the in the airport or something and seeing a magazine cover of men's health or something and, and thinking, oh, I, I should look like that. <laughs> uh, that's the ideal that's given to me. This is, this is the physique that uh, you will make you popular and attractive to others and, um, and will be such a source of happiness <laughs> To you, so those messages are constantly coming to us. We live in a uh, uh, in a society where materialism is promoted, uh, and if you have these things or more of these things, uh, or you have wealth and all of these things that wealth can give you, then you will really find happiness and fulfillment in life. So we're given pictures of people who are happy and enjoying themselves and stuff using a particular product. So um, uh, we are subject to this kind of advertising, these constant bombardment of messages that are coming from the culture, um, that are coming from our peers and from our generation. Uh, uh, we have constantly uh, receiving messages that this is what you should desire. This is what you should aim for. This is what will bring you uh, happiness and fulfillment in life. So, uh, um, so these um, attachments are just not things that just originate with us. They are the they are the assumptions that surround us in society, and uh, um, and so it's very easy for us to buy into them and to think that. Uh, uh, climbing the ladder to success uh, is the thing that will bring us ultimate fulfillment and joy and happiness. Um, but we, uh, uh, the first step in getting free from these disordered attachments is to realize that these are false beliefs and that when we uh, put our trust and confidence in any external thing, uh, we we are on shaky ground, and uh, we we uh, can easily uh, find ourselves in bondage to that thing uh, that the world has convinced us uh, is so essential to our happiness and well-being. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit in this session about when we come to recognize these disordered attachments uh, underlying. Uh, our fears, our anger, our resentment, our jealousies. Uh, uh, what do we do about them? How do we get free from them? And uh, before I do that, I'd like to tell you a story. 
uh, a story about myself and my own discovery of an attachment. Um, when I was, uh, well, was several years ago, maybe even a decade or more ago, uh, probably even more than a decade or more ago, when I was just beginning to lead retreats and programs and stuff, I was invited to accompany another brother to lead a, a retreat for clergy in the Diocese of Colorado. And uh, I was very excited to, to have this opportunity and very excited to accompany this brother who was uh, uh, more experienced at this than I. And, uh, and I thought it would be wonderful to be paired up with him and be able to learn from him and work with him. So we flew out to uh, Colorado and we met with this group of clergy uh, for this retreat. And the brother that I was with uh, gave the opening address on the opening night. And, uh, and he was brilliant. <laughs> uh, he, it was so good. <laughs> uh, he had the room was was quiet, everyone was engaged, they were just kind of taking in his words and it was just mesmerizing. And, and what he said what, felt so profound to me and so, so wonderful. And I, uh, it was curious because uh, um, I went back to my room after the session and I found myself feeling depressed and so discouraged and sad and I, couldn't uh, figure out why I was having these strong emotions, these kind of negative emotions, uh, after what should have been a, a, a positive experience. And until I realized that uh, actually I was afraid, I was afraid that I couldn't follow uh, him, <laughs> that uh, my address, I was supposed to speak first thing in the morning, and the address that I prepared wouldn't be nearly as good as his. And, uh, and I was afraid of uh, embarrassing myself or embarrassing the society by, uh, by giving a, an inadequate address and, um, and by humiliating myself by uh, being so obviously inferior to this other brother. <laughs> But you see, uh, you see there uh, that there are disordered attachments at work. I was unhappy. I was miserable because I thought it was very important to be successful in this environment, in this task that I'd been given. I wanted to impress people. I wanted them to say, wow, he's also a very good re retreat leader. <laughs> so I, I wanted to uh, be appreciated by this audience. I wanted to uh, have them think highly of me. Uh, so all of those kind of underlying assumptions that I somehow needed the approval of this group of people in order to be able to feel good about myself, in order to, uh, uh, and, and I was putting so much weight on on their response. It's the same thing we do when we're attached to people's approval or attached to popularity or, or to fame or to success. Uh, it matters what other people think of us. And so we're trying to constantly impress or please. And uh, we, we lose our way then. And I was uh, losing my way and falling into a place of discouragement because I thought I couldn't equal the um, the work that the brother and my brother had done on the previous evening. But once I once I was able to identify that that attachment uh, and say that's what this is about. That's why I'm feeling sad. That's why I'm feeling anxious and afraid. It's because I'm I'm clinging to the my need to have this audience approve of me. Once I could see that was true, then I could then I could counter that false belief. And I could say to myself, well, you know, you've come with something to offer. So just stand up and offer it. <laughs> and it won't be the same as Brother X's. It, it will be your offering. And uh, some people may respond to it. Uh, uh, and some people may not. 
And uh, it may be that uh, Brother X uh, uh, has the more effective addresses, but what does it matter? <laughs> what does it matter? Your worth doesn't depend on this. Uh, your happiness doesn't depend on this. Um, uh, why should you care so very much about what the clergy of the Diocese of Colorado think of you? <laughs> you know, you're never going to see these people again. <laughs> why do you? Why are you so invested in their opinion of you? And so once it, once you begin to see how this thing has gotten power over you, this attachment is exercising its power over you and, and causing anxiety and fear and discouragement, uh, then you can counter that and say, is that an assumption that I want to make? Is that actually true? And say, it's not true. My, my value is not dependent on other people's approval or their, uh, uh, the, the number of compliments that I get or or positive feedback that I get uh, from, from whatever I do here. And uh, as soon as I understood that, I, I felt much more free. I said, I'm, I'm a former elementary school teacher. I'm not the most sophisticated or well-read or deepest thinker in the community. And um, I just uh, have to get up and tell what I'm thinking of and as the way I would tell it, you know, um, not, not try to be uh, someone else or try to measure up to someone else. Um, uh, comparing ourselves with others is such a dead end. Uh, it never comes to anything good. If we compare ourselves and think that we're better than this other person, then we, uh, we, uh, that is not going to bring us happiness. And if we think we're worse than this other person, uh, we're, we're going to be equally uh, trapped. And so uh, when you find yourself comparing yourself with someone else, um, stop it immediately. <laughs> Don't go there. It's, there's no good that can come of it. And uh, that's exactly what I was doing. Uh, uh, so, so part of the, the path toward freedom from these disordered attachments is to recognize them and to name them and to see how they have uh, gained power over us and how they are influencing us and how they are causing negative emotions, uh, anger and fear and anxiety are creeping in because we think we need this thing and we're trying our best to possess it and have it for ourselves. And actually our happiness and our worth uh, don't lie in these external things at all. Our worth comes from God. God says that we're worthy. And it doesn't depend on any degrees that we have or any titles that we have or uh, how large our salary is or how uh, many friends we can count up uh, that we have. Uh, none of those things are our ultimate reflectors of our value and our worth. God says that we are worthy simply because we're made in the image of God and God loves us. And so we find our identity in, in that internal truth that we are beloved children of God and not in uh, these external uh, uh, things. So awareness is key to the path uh, out of the bondage of these disordered attachments. And I'd like to suggest that the awareness can come to us from two different things. One, uh, one piece of this awareness is to become aware of the pain that this disordered attachment is causing me. Look at this and say, why am I miserable? Why am I unhappy? Why am I anxious or afraid or upset? Why am I feeling so resentful? Look at these negative emotions and say, look at the, the roller coaster of emotion I've put myself on by clinging to this thing and convincing myself that I need this thing in order to be happy and fulfilled. See what misery it's causing me. And once we recognize that, we will be motivated to let it go because we see that the, the damage that it causes, the, the, the trauma that it leads us into. 
And, uh, and so we see the falseness of this belief and we see the consequences of our clinging to it. So that's one area to look at the pain that it's causing us, to look at the distress that it's bringing into our lives by our convincing ourselves that we need to have this thing. And, and then the second thing is to imagine what freedom looks like. And maybe you've had an experience in your life where you have felt free simply to be who you are and to, uh, to, to, to be free from other people's expectations or from your own internal demands, from all the shoulds that your inner should person is telling you, you should be like this, you should do this, you should be that, all of those things. Maybe you've had a moment where you have experienced uh, true freedom. And sometimes when we, when we know what that freedom feels like, uh, we, can, we can go back to that feeling and saying, yes, that's what I want to feel like again. I want to find that place of freedom. So there's both this negative motivation. I want to avoid all of this pain and, and trauma, but also the positive of, uh, of motivation of I've tasted freedom before. I want, to, I want to live in that kind of freedom where I'm simply enjoying life and simply enjoying people without having to cling to them or without having to impress, or without having to have a certain response from, from that person. The key is to learn to enjoy things just as they are, without trying to possess them. And so uh, this friendship that I have, I, when I'm with this person, I thoroughly enjoy them. But I don't need to possess them. I don't need to have a certain uh, response from them. I, I, I free myself from the disappointment of not getting the response that I wanted by simply enjoying them in freedom. In our rule, uh, in the chapter on friendship, it talks about, it talks about this. It says, uh, this is chapter 42 of SSJE's rule, The Graces of Friendship. It says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So we shall seek to let go of possessiveness and extend this freedom to one another. We try not to possess a friend in community and say, that's my friend. Uh, he, he spends time with me, I spend time with him and to the exclusion of the other brothers. I want to possess this person. So we have to have, the rule says, we have to have the freedom continually to release our brother for relationships with others. Just as in those dances in which the movements constantly weave fresh links between the dancers. I think is a wonderful image. And I've come back to that image time and again. You know, these kind of dances where the partners, uh, the people in the dance uh, uh, are temporarily joined to this person and then they let go and they, and they take this person in hand and the dancers weave among themselves. But uh, no one stays exclusively with their partner, but is willing to take the next person and let go of this person for the dance to flow and move. And so in our human relationships, when we insist on clinging to a person, uh, uh, maybe we feel jealous or threatened if we see someone else uh, spending time with this person that we, that we want for our own particular friend. Um, so we lose our freedom, our freedom and our ability to enjoy the friendship because we're constantly worried about uh, losing our status with this person, uh, as if uh, uh, having this person's approval and attention uh, was so important to us that we couldn't, uh, we couldn't live without it. Uh, we have to learn to enjoy the, the diversity of people rather than cling to this one person to say, I'm with this person now and I'll enjoy that. But if 
that person goes off with someone else, then I will be with this person and I'll enjoy them. And I'll, I'll just be present with whoever I'm with and I'll enjoy their presence without trying to control or to, to possess or to cling. And so we can learn to uh, develop a kind of wider and broader palette, <laughs> enjoying all kinds of things in life and all kinds of people in life without necessarily having to possess them or control them. Um, our happiness doesn't depend on this attachment. So if your attachments have caused you suffering and sorrow, that's a help to understanding, to seeing the truth of this false belief and to letting go of it. And conversely, if, the, if at least once in your life you've experienced the sweet taste of freedom and the delight that a life that uh, uh, lived in unattachment brings, that too can be a help. So the, the positive help of imagining freedom, the kind of more negative uh, help of recognizing pain and distress that's been brought into our life. Um, seeing the kind of um, suffering that has come by overvaluing one thing. When we listen to an orchestra, we have to be open to the many sounds. If we focus on just one sound, we won't be able to take in the diversity and beauty of the orchestra. And so, um, so it, it's a matter of, of, of awareness. Of, and uh, how do we get to this awareness? I think it's by, by uh, paying attention. <laughs> Uh, to what's happening interiorly to us, noticing these negative emotions that come up, being able to identify their connection. Why am I feeling so distressed right now? Uh, recognizing uh, that this false belief has imprisoned me and captured me and, and that I'm actually in bondage now and I've lost my freedom to just simply enjoy uh, uh, to, so contemplate the, uh, the, your, the ideas in your head, uh, your habits, the, the ways that you tend to go in your mind, and uh, the way that you interpret the things that happen to you, and what you tell yourself about what has just happened. You know, if you, you see your friend uh, making a date to go out with someone else, and the message that you tell yourself is, oh, oh I'm going to lose this friend he's going to become uh, her friend and, and he'll have less time for me. And uh, uh, if I'm telling myself this narrative, I will, I will soon slip into this kind of bondage. So spend time observing your, your inner topography. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? How are your feelings and your thoughts related? How are these thoughts and this interpretation causing these feelings um, and, uh, and see if I can begin to imagine a different way, uh, see the situation or see the other person or see this thing that I think I need so badly in a fresh light. Um, so uh, it, it requires some reflective listening and, and uh, paying attention to our inner lives. Uh, you might remember if you've read about the desert fathers that one of the practices was when a, a young person came out and wanted to live as a hermit in the desert, they were often assigned uh, a, an elder uh, to accompany them and to uh, train them in the life. And one of the things that was asked of the young person is that he would go uh, frequently and regularly to the elder to which he was assigned and that he would, uh, as they called it, manifest his thoughts. In other words, he would say, here's what happened today and here's what I was thinking and this is what the feelings that came up for me and this is what, and the elder would help him sort through those things and to recognize what was true and of God and what was not true and, and was not of God and, and help him find his way through that. And so, so that manifesting our thoughts 
uh, sometimes to another person or to a spiritual director or to a priest or a clergy person or just to a good friend who we trust and who has some insight uh, might uh, be a way of uh, helping us understand these forces within us. Realize that there is no thing or person outside of you that has the power to make you happy or unhappy. It's only you that decides to be happy or unhappy. It's, it's your interpretation, your slant on things, your insight. And uh, so remember, uh, dear sister, Mary Tricky, if you really want to be happy, <laughs> no one can stop you. Um, so what does this freedom look like? Well, we, we see it in the life and teaching of Jesus. Uh, Matthew 6, do not worry, says Jesus. Consider the lilies. They don't toil or labor, and you're of much more value. You know, consider the birds of the air, how free they are. And they don't worry about where they're going to get their food from. or how it, uh, They simply uh, live in uh, freedom. And Jesus says, don't be like those people who obsess about what, what shall I eat? What shall I drink? What shall I wear? But lives are consumed with, with these external things. But uh, find the freedom of detachment that allows you to enjoy things without clinging to them, without making them uh, the center of your life. Um, so he teaches us to live in that kind of freedom. And he warns us about it, trying to possess. He said, what, what profit is there if you gain the whole world but lose your life? What if you gain? If you gain riches or notoriety or fame or success or uh, uh, what have you gained really? Uh, and have you risked losing your life in order to gain this thing? Some of uh, going back to our illustration of a politician, it could be anyone, it doesn't have to be a politician, but someone who has fixed uh, their hopes on something and, and uh, has a disordered attachment and needs this thing, and that filter is coloring everything in their lives. Going, going back to that and seeing how they have in fact lost their life. They may be seen as successful by others, but in fact, they become calloused persons who uh, are insensitive to the needs of people around them in their medium because they are so focused and so absorbed and so under the control of this thing, which they think is so important. Um, Jesus says, whoever does not hate father or mother or even life itself cannot be my own. Disciple is saying that in order to follow me, you have to hold these things so loosely. And of course, this is a Palestinian way, an Eastern way of emphasizing a point by saying, whoever does not hate father and mother, Jesus is not encouraging us to hate our father and mother, but he's saying, you can, you can be so attached even to your parents and to their opinions and to their uh, desires that you lose your freedom. And, uh, and so uh, to detach from them, to let go of, of them in order to uh, uh, hold them, you hold them in love, but you hold them with open palms, not with clinging palms. And so that you're not subject to fear of what they might uh, say or do to you, uh, step into freedom. Um, I love the example of St. Paul, who I think lived this uh, kind of freedom. And one of the places that I often uh, point people to is the story in Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas have been arrested. Um, they, uh, there was a girl who was prophesying in the public square, and her owners were using her ability to uh, 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 prophesy as a means of income for themselves. And uh, Paul and Silas encountered her and cast out a demon from her. And so uh, these 
people lost their source of income. So they stirred up the crowds against Paul and Silas and the crowds began to beat them and shout at them and, and harass them. And, uh, and then the authorities came and arrested them, uh, beat them more. Uh, in fact, they received the 39 lashes and then were thrown into a prison and put in chains. And, uh, and then we read this remarkable verse. After all this has happened to them, we read, at midnight, Paul and Silas were singing hymns and praising God. And we say, what gives a person that kind of freedom to be able to rejoice in God even when uh, they are in such terrible circumstances? Um, and I think it's because Paul has discovered the, the secret of freedom, knowing himself to be loved by God. He's, he's, he's absorbed the truth uh, that he expresses in Romans chapter 8, that nothing, nothing, nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, there is no force, there's no person, there's no circumstance that's powerful enough to separate him from the love of God. He says, nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so he knows himself to be loved. He knows himself to be a beloved child of God. And if he's hungry or if he's shipwrecked or if he's, uh, if he's uh, uh, in difficult circumstances or if he's persecuted or if he's mocked or if he's ridiculed or if he's beaten or if he's thrown into prison, none of these things can touch this identity that he knows himself to be loved by God. And he is thoroughly convinced that nothing, nothing, nothing can separate him from the love of God. Nothing can change the fact that he is a beloved child of God. And he lives out of that identity. His identity isn't rooted in external things. He writes to the Philippians and he says, you know, I had it all once. I was from a prestigious family. I was born a Hebrew of Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin. I had a fine education. I had the best education. I was educated as a Pharisee and, and taught by knowledgeable people. I, I had status in the community. I was a persecutor of the church and people looked up to me. They admired my zeal. They praised me for what I was doing. I, I had all of these things. I had family and education and uh, uh, success and a reputation, uh, uh, a good reputation and the admiration of others. I had all of these things. And then he turns out a, a verse later and he says, but all of these things I count as refuse. They're, I count them as loss. They don't matter to me anymore. I'm not living anymore to try to gain the respect or admiration of other people. I'm not living to uh, uh, avoid difficulties and to be successful. I'm not living to uh, uh, show off my, uh, my pedigree or my achievements or my degrees or my status. I, those are not the things that define me anymore. I count them all as lost for the sake of knowing Christ being found in his love. And I think it's that freedom that he has. And that's what he encourages in his letter to the Galatians. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. So stand fast, therefore, in freedom and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. I have a quote. <laughs> So the quote from St. John Chrysostom, a portion of a sermon of St. John Chrysostom. Uh, he says, uh, tell me, what are we to fear? Is it death? But for me, life is Christ and death is gain. So tell me, is it exile? The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains? Is it the confiscation of property? 
we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can take nothing out of it. I have nothing but contempt for the threats of this world. Its treasures I ridicule. I am not afraid of poverty. I do not crave after wealth. I am not afraid of death. And I do not seek to live except it be of help to you. So I simply mention my present circumstances and call on you, my dear people, to remain steadfast in your love. Do you not hear the Lord saying, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am among them? Where will he be absent? For where will there not be two or three bound together by love? I have his pledge. So I do not have to rely on my own strength. I cling to his promise. It is my staff, my security. It is my peaceful harbor. Even though the entire world be in turmoil, I cling to this promise and read it. It is my rampart and my shield. What promise is this? I am with you always, even to the end of time. Christ is with me. Whom then shall I fear? Let the waves rise up against me, the seas, the wrath of rulers. These things to me are mere cobwebs. And if you, my dear people, had not held me back, I would have left this very day. I always say, Lord, your will be done. Not what this person or that person wishes but as you wish. This is my fortress. This is my immovable rock. This is my firm staff. If God wishes this to be, then so be it. If he wishes me to be here, I thank him. Wherever he wants me to be, I thank him. So you see the kind of freedom that he's expressing here. I don't have to be successful or popular or famous or wealthy. Uh, the only thing matters is that I belong to Christ. And Christ has promised to be with me always. And I know that nothing can separate me from his love. And so I can live in complete freedom. And I can even experience uh, the waves and torments of life and uh, the ridicule of others and the threats of the authorities, uh, I, I don't worry about those things because I'm held by Christ and he's promised never to leave me. And, and uh, I know I will never be separated from his love. I went on a retreat once at a, as a Jesuit retreat center. There were a number of us on this retreat and, and uh, we had a lunch in the cafeteria of the retreat center and there were several older Jesuits uh, residing in that place. And there was one in particular who caught our eye. Uh, everyone on the retreat uh, remarked about this. There was an old Jesuit who would come into the dining hall and there was just something about him. He, he kind of glowed. <laughs> And uh, we talked with one another about it. And finally, someone worked up the nerve to go up to him and to introduce themselves to him and say, you know, uh, we've noticed something special about you. There's a kind of a, an aura of, of joy and freedom and peace about you. And what is it that, uh, what is, what's your secret <laughs> kind of? And this Jesuit replied, he said, well, I've given it all away. I've given it all away. I'm not looking to, to have a certain things or to possess certain things. He's not grasping for certain things. He's not striving to climb some ladder to greater success or notoriety or something. He's given it all away. And he's uh, content to just abide in God. And... Um, the, the kind of freedom and joy radiated from his being. So what are some characteristics of this, um, 
of this freedom that we're being offered that Jesus talks about, that St. Paul talks about, that John Chrysostom talks about, that, um, um, that Ignatius talks about. First of all, it's not, it's not something that comes to us through effort. We may be able to change our behaviors by effort, but it doesn't change the person. It doesn't change us necessarily. And so uh, this freedom will come to us as we become aware, as we see the things that have trapped us and uh, held us in bondage. And as we gradually let go of them, it will emerge of its own doing. It's, it's not about effort so much as it is about awareness and about careful introspection, about seeing and uh, noticing and then letting go. Secondly, this, this freedom uh, enables us to live in the present moment. We're not living in the past. We're not resting on our achievements of the past, nor are we living in the future about what we might be someday or what we might have or what we might accomplish. We're simply able to be in the present moment and enjoy the present moment and enjoy the person that we're with right now. Enjoy the circumstance that we're in right now without having to cling to it or manage it or improve it or change it or somehow get to some other uh, situation. Third, this inner freedom does not look to outward things for meaning, satisfaction, or happiness. Our happiness comes from our identity and our security as children of God, not from anything external that we can win or uh, some reward that we can gain. Or that helps us find our identity in God rather than in physical beauty or success or wealth or power or possessions or other people and so on. It helps us to root our identity in God. What brings us joy and freedom and happiness is knowing that we belong to God, that we are forever loved by God, and that nothing can take away that love. It will lead to the enjoyment of the fruit of the Spirit. Remember the fruit that uh, Paul names in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. All of those things flow from this inner freedom. And finally, it manifests itself in contentment in contentment. Paul says to the Philippians chapter four, I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty, and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul has learned to be content with whatever he has. He's not insisting that uh, life be one thing or another. He's, he's able to find contentment and enjoyment in in whatever he has in the present moment. So this brings us to the end of our second session. And uh, what I, do you remember the story I told you at the beginning of this session about my experience of uh, uh, co-leading a retreat for clergy uh, with a, a more experienced and probably more talented brother and uh, my fears about that. Well, I, I've taken that example and I've kind of broken it down into stages. And I've identified five steps. I'm, uh, Andrew, in just a few moments, is going to send you a copy of this 
Uh, in the first column, I've identified these five steps that we can take to move us toward greater freedom. And in the second column, I've used my example to identify what happens in each of those steps. The example that I gave you about the clergy retreat. Um, so the first step is to identify the emotion and the circumstance that has prompted it. So what am I feeling? And where are these feelings coming from? What's just happened? What did that person say? What did I, what happened to me? What, what, what did I experience? And what emotions uh, uh, rose out of that? Identify the emotions and try to identify the circumstance that brought them about. So am I feeling anger? Am I feeling jealousy? Am I feeling disappointment? If I, I'm feeling resentment, where is that coming from? What circumstances prompted it? What, uh, what words or actions are, uh, uh, have come about that have, uh, have prompted these feelings? And then step two is to explore the emotion. Look more closely at the context and search for the cause. Really try to get uh, un what I envision is kind of picking up a thread and following it back. So you recognize the emotion and what you're feeling and the distress it's causing you, but you follow the thread back and say, what, what is this thing linked to? Where did it come from? What, uh, 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 what caused it? The third step is to identify the cause more deeply and identify the attachment. What is it that I'm attached to? What is it that I think that I'm not getting or that I should be getting or that I want to get that I'm not getting? Or uh, what is it that, I, that I'm getting that I don't want to have? Or uh, you know, what is it that's attached to this? And to really explore my inner thoughts and feelings um, to see what it is that's triggering um, this response. And then step four is to challenge these negative feelings and their underlying uh, causes. So to, to talk back to them, say, wait a minute, I'm assuming that the opinion of these Colorado clergy actually somehow affects my, my worth as a person. That I'm going to challenge that assumption and challenge that belief. That's not, that's not true. And what is the truth about who I am and where my value and worth come from? But they don't come from the Colorado clergy. They come from, from what God says about me that, uh, uh, and from my, my relationship as a child of God. And then uh, step five is to affirm the truth about myself and others and notice the feelings of freedom that come with this truth. And the truth shall set you free. Once we see the situation and we see the false assumptions that we've made and we recognize the truth about ourselves that it doesn't depend on all of these external factors, we can experience this flood of freedom and, uh, and uh, embrace the freedom that comes. So, um, so you'll see here, the first column, naming these steps, these five steps. The second column, how I went through this in the, my own experience the example I gave you. The third column is blank for you to take and to Go through these steps yourselves. Maybe you have identified some circumstance of uh, some place of unhappiness, and you suspect there's an underlying cause here, a kind of disordered attachment that's uh, uh, prompting these emotions to, you know, so, to work through the steps yourself and see if you can uh, come to a greater sense of freedom in it. You can do this exercise now in the little break that we have, or you can hold on to it and do it later when you have some um, more time and space to, to really um, uh, get into it. And then I'd like to uh, go to the third section of this, which is to talk specifically about love. 
and uh, two different kinds of love, an unhealthy love and a healthy love. Uh, what are the difference uh, between these two kinds of love? And how does this whole um, concept of attachment, disordered attachments, uh, um, affect our relationships with other people? 